We're in the last part of the unit today on uh, in James. And still still talking about really about your speech and how this relates to your faith and uh, how they go together. You know, um, when we talk about how you speak versus what you do, uh, it really is, they really are kind of both the same. They arise out of the same thing. They arise out of faith. Uh, what we do, what we say, they arise from the same place. Um, it's, it's the thoughts, and it's, it's your state of, uh, state of your spiritual walk with God. And... Um, the things that we do day to day, that's, that's also part of it. And what, what the lesson talks about today is called faith on display in your priorities. So what we prioritize in our lives, that's also part of it. That's a sign of how our walk with God is. And, and you know, when we talk about, like, what is, your, what is your life, right? People have asked that question. You may have asked yourself that question. But, but the question, what is your life? What is your life? And what are you doing with your life? You may have heard that as well. What are you doing with your life? Um, and if you think about that question, it's, it's an interesting question just, just to ponder the question. If, if you think about it this way, I had a, I had a buddy one time uh, who he knew I was a Christian, and he was just trying to challenge me. And he asked me this, this old riddle. Uh, he said, can God create a stone so heavy that he could not lift it. And it's a riddle to make you question God. And it's, it's a riddle to, if I say, yes, God can create a stone that he could not lift, then I say God is not power. I question God's power. If I say there is such a thing as a stone God cannot lift, that he can create it, I also question God's power. So, so sometimes you'll get caught up on that. And I did get caught up on that for a while until I figured out the question doesn't make sense. The, the, the error is in the question because the, an, I, the, a stone that God cannot lift is nonsense. Right? right? And that's, that's, where it, that's where it hangs up on itself. The question is nonsense. Can God create a stone that he cannot lift? Is, can God create a, a gooba gaba gooba? It's nonsense. Can he create a triangle with eight sides? You know, it's nonsense. So can God do nonsense? No. Uh, and that's the same with this question. What is your life? What you're doing with your life? Well, your life, that's nonsense. Your life is not yours. You don't have a life. Your life is not anything. Your life is a puff of smoke. It's like it lasts in the air for like half a second, and then it's gone. But the life that God has given you, that is what your life is. It's a gift from God, and it belongs to God, and it's been purchased with a price, God says. And so what is that? What are you doing then with that? What are you doing with God's life that is on loan to you? What are you doing with that life that God has loaned to you and that you are responsible for when he draws it back to him? It's his, his possession. It's his ownership. Let's pray, and we'll look at what James says about that in, in the verses. Lord God, thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the ability to stand up here and, and to teach your word, Father. And we pray today that everyone here will receive a blessing from, from what we have to, to uh, teach today. And I ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit just be among us and be the one to teach and to deliver a message that, that everyone needs to hear exactly, Father. And if someone here needs to hear this for, for um, encouragement or for salvation, Father, that this will be exactly what needs to go out. And we ask, Father, that you'll be with us throughout the service today. Let us all be... Uh, upraised and uplifted by what you have to say to us today, and then just be in good fellowship all, all this day and, and the rest of our days. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's look at the verses. We're in James 14, 13 through 17. If you're in the book, it starts on page 70 there. Um, so it's James 4, 13, and we're starting just a little after the last lesson here, just a few lines down from there. So James is switching gears here, but we'll go through it. 13 through 17 says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life, even a vapor, that appears for a little time, and then vanishes away? 
For what you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So you look at the first verse there, verse 13. He's, he's talking about doing, doing a discussion of arrogance versus humility. And he gives us an example of how the thinking is of arrogant people. Arrogant people, in this example, they're making plans. They're saying, we're going to move somewhere. We're going to live there for a while. We're going to start a business. We're going to make some money. And so if you look at that on its face, what's wrong with that? That sounds like a good plan. That sounds like something a lot of people do, and it works out. It's a good idea. But there is a huge, huge piece of this missing. And what these people are saying in James' example here, right? Now, we know what that is. This planning begins on a very wrong step. It's off step from the beginning. And that step is that, that this, this group here, they're leaving God out of their plans, all of their plans. Leaves God out from the very start. And James presents this as a group, but we can understand that this is also something that an individual can say to himself in his mind, right? I will go tomorrow to the city. I'm going to live there. I'm going to buy and sell. I'm going to get gain. So this is, this is a single person's thought, whether, whether lost or saved. A, a person's thought without God is, is starting off in error and starting off in a bad place. So this represents a single person's thoughts too. And it could be across many different scenarios, not just uh, mercantilism or moving somewhere, but making plans. And we say to ourselves... I will go there, I will do this, I will do that, and it's under my control, and I'm in charge of it all. I know how it will work out, and we take ownership of our lives from the start, and we say that. Right. It's my life. I'm, it's my life. Again, it's not our life. That's nonsense to say my life. It's not my life. And we think about, what is your life? What is my life? Well, my life is my choices, it's my body, it's my, uh, the, the things that I do, right? But it's, it's not. It's, I, it's a a life that's on loan to me, and um, I'm to do with it, I'm to be a good steward of my life. When we talk about stewardship, we think about, you know, uh, the world and resources and money, but we're also stewardship of our lives. And, and the very breath that we have, we are responsible for what we do with it. And that's, that goes back to the speech and things like that. When you breathe in and out, that's, that's life for you. But you notice that when you breathe out and cause it to vibrate your vocal cords, that's speech. So it's, it's part of the life that's in you, is the things that you say. It's all integrated into it. So we have to be responsible with all of that. And so when we say to ourselves, it's all about me, that's an attitude of pride. So it's, I'm going to do this or that on my own. I'm going to go to church this morning on my own. I will get there safely on my own. I will receive the Spirit's message today on my own. And I'm going to get all through life on my own. That's what an arrogant, proud person will say. And now, how is that different from the attitude of the unbeliever then? we are uh, saved. The unbeliever that says, I'm going to live my life on my own. I'm going to survive the grave on my own. I'm going to redeem myself on my own. And I'm going to save myself. Start making plans without God. That's what an unbeliever does, right? So, if you look in verse 14, James, he goes back to, to what the reality is. He says, you know not what shall be on the morrow. So, he's, you don't know what it's going to be happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen. You can't plan anything without God. It's, it's a fallacy. It's lunacy to plan anything without including God. Because we can observe that we don't know what's going to happen. That's, that's, a, that's a very basic thing that we know. Like If you ask me what uh, the weather will be tomorrow, I couldn't tell you. Even if I had looked on a, the phone or on an app or something and, and looked up the weather on here, they're not always right. The weatherman will give you a percentage chance of what it would be. He doesn't know. He's, he's a guess. Uh, and if you ask me uh, right now if there's uh, like a, a grizzly bear in the yard, I don't know. I can look out the windows, but I can't see everywhere. I can see as far as this wall. That's the limit of my perception. But God's perception does not have a limit. So would I trust myself? When I make plans, or will I trust God when I make plans? Will I trust myself, who can see as far as this wall? Will I trust God, who can see 
as far as he can see, which is everywhere. So we can see that it's, it's, it's a fallacy. It's kind of dumb to trust ourselves instead of God. So let's not do that. So the things that we know are limited, and, and James uh, says that. He says, you know not what shall be. You know not. You don't know. So why, why trust ourselves in things that we don't know? And he says in 14, life is even a vapor. And it's in uh, Genesis 2, 7. says, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we are a vapor. What does a vapor do? Well, uh, a vapor is not long-lasting, is it? A vapor is, dissolves away. You've seen people that use the vapes instead of smoking. Uh, it, uh, it's different from smoking. The people that, that vape, the, the cigarette smoke will last in the air for a long time. The little vape things, they puff and it's gone away. I guess that's part of the allure of it. It's like it doesn't hang around much, right? But that's, that's a little more like what he's talking about here. I don't think they had vapes in James' time, but he probably would have been understood what we're talking about here, that that vapor just goes away like that. Like How long does it, does it last? And really, what use is it? What use is a puff of smoke that comes out of a cigarette or a vape a pipe or whatever? It's useless because it's not. you couldn't even grab onto it to do anything with it. It's useless. And to grab onto it and say, this is, I'm, this is mine, I'm taking hold of it, I'm going to use it for right. something, that's, that's useless because he says, your life isn't anything. The life that God gives you, that's something. Because your life is not going to hang around. The, th- the life that God's give you is going to be eternal. Amen. So that's the life you should focus on. And not only is your body just dust, it's going away. Your soul is a spiritual vapor. And that's what we have from Genesis, that the God breathed the soul into you. And God, you know, when you breathe out, what happens after that? You breathe in. God is going to breathe you back in, back to him, someday. And he's going to, he's going to taste that. It's going to be sweet or it's going to be bitter to him. And you're going to, you're going to be judged on that. When God breathes you back in, what's it going to be? What's he going to find that you, you, you are, that breath that he breathed out, what did it become? What did you turn it into when it came, comes back to him? So in verse 15 he says, give an alternate point of view then, the one that we should have. You notice he says in the, in the first two verses there, this is, what, this is what people do now, the prideful people. 15 he says, this is what you ought to do. So we're starting with what we ought to do. He gives us the other, the worldly, the non-worldly, but the godly way to be, the righteous way to be. He says, make your plans, but start with God. He says, if the Lord will. And he goes down, even down to the most basic thing. You ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live. From the very start. What, what, what should we do? What should we start with? What should we plan to do? Well, if the Lord li- wills, I will be alive today. I'll be alive this second, so the Lord wills it. And if he doesn't, y'all have to call me out of here, because if he doesn't will it, it will not happen. So if the Lord wills, we shall live. And then let's go on from there. Then if the Lord wills, we shall do this. And if the Lord wills, we shall do that. So start everything with if the Lord wills, even down to the most basic, because it is all in God's hands, right? And then how extreme do I get with that, Jason? Do Do I say... If God wills, I'll go out to eat today. If God wills, I'll go to work today. Yeah. Because if the Lord doesn't will it, you will not have anything to eat. And if the Lord doesn't will, you will not go to work today. So all of that, yes, if the Lord wills it. Give God the the glory to that. Give God the credit for that. And ask God for it. And don't take it for granted, I think is what James is saying. And he says, do this or that. He's not saying don't make plans at all. We're supposed to make plans. It's in our book on page 70. I think you make a good point there. Uh, They say nothing, in page 70 at the top there, it says nothing is wrong with planning. In fact, the Bible contains several proverbs that encourage us to make plans. And I I would like to just read those proverbs. It says, Proverbs 6 talks about the ant. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. So, plans. And Proverbs 15, 22, 
Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. And in Proverbs 20, 18, every purpose is established by counsel and with good advice make war. So planning, even in those cases. And in Proverbs 21, 5, says the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty, only to want. So it talks about don't be hasty, but plan and provide for the future. So he advocates for making plans. But we know that if if we begin with God, then we can have confidence that we're going to have a good outcome for whatever we're planning, as long as we begin with God and we do it in in a a walk with God. Because then it flips everything around. If we begin without God and say, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to do, do that, it's going to be successful, it's arrogance and pride. If we start with God, and we trust in God, and we say, if God wills it, this is going to be successful. I'm going to do this, and it's going to work out. It turns around, then it becomes faith and trust in God. It becomes the opposite of pride and arrogance, the exact opposite. It becomes faith and trust in God, then. And all we have to do is take that little thing, that little talk with Jesus, is all it takes, to turn that around from pride and arrogance to trust and faith. And, and just humility, a little humility is all it takes, and it will turn that right around. And to do otherwise is pride and arrogance. And James says this is boasting. And boasting, I looked, up, looked that up, it says to praise oneself extravagantly in speech, speak of oneself with excessive pride. Now, we don't want to be like that. But I did notice the synonyms of, of boasting is to glorify and to exalt. Now, who are we supposed to glorify and exalt? Not me, not myself. This is supposed to be, that's supposed to go to God. So when I'm boasting, according to James, making plans without God is boasting. I'm glorifying myself. I'm exalting myself. When I'm putting God first, when I make plans, I'm glorifying Him. I'm exalting Him. So you see how they're, they, they're the exact switch, the way that we do it. And, and James says, therefore, and when there's, there's, there's a therefore, it means because of what I just said, then this. So he's therefore... To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not. To him it is sin. So if you know what to do that is righteous, and don't do it, that is sin. So inaction is not sinlessness. And the warning against arrogance and self-importance is, is part of that. So if you know what is right, and, and you don't do it, that's, that's sinful, right? And to, to, It's a, a little bit about what, the belief, what you believe is right, right? If I know what is right then sometimes I won't do what I should do. If I believe that maybe I don't know what is right, but that God knows what is right, and I should not take what I know what is right, instead put what the Spirit tells me is right, what God has said is right in His Holy Word, then I will do what is right. And not think about how I know what, how to respond to something, but how God wants me to respond to it, and, and how I'm taught to respond to it by Him. And then it becomes... Not arrogance and self-importance. It becomes humility. Um, and that's in uh, page 71 of the book. It talks about that as well. It talks about planning and um, arrogance. It says, planning is important, but planning is also fallible. Even the wisest executives cannot know what the future holds. Only God knows the future, and only God is infallible. These truths should humble even the most confident planner. However, the business people in James's example lacked humility and made their plans as if they confidently knew the future. Plans are good, but these people were boasting in their arrogance. Their arrogant action was not that they made plans. It was that they thought they knew or could control the future. They could not control the future. And that was, that was their, their error. Uh, does anybody want to add anything? We'll go on to the next one. Okay, we'll go to uh, James 5, it's 7 through 11. Okay, so he says um, in uh, James 5, 7 here, he says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, a judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. 
Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So we have a, a, an urging from James to plan your lives, plan our lives around the coming of the Lord. Right? Plan the lives that God gave us around the coming of the Lord when he will take them back. So patient and expectant waiting is what we should have for him. And James compares this to, to the farmer, farmer who plants crops. And the farmer plants his crops, he doesn't know when the rain is going to come. And the farmer doesn't know what the conditions will be for the next growing season. Uh, but the farmer, when, when he goes out to, to plant his crops, he doesn't say to himself, um, well, I don't know if there's going to be any rain. I don't know if there will be a blight. I don't know if there will be a, a bad season or a cold snap. So I'm just not going to plant anything. That would be a bad farmer. You would know that you would not be successful as a farmer, right? So it's likewise, we don't know when the Lord is coming to take us home, and I, we don't know if it's going to come in our lifetime. Uh, so we don't know, like the farmer, we don't know what the conditions are going to be when he returns, right? We don't know what the condition of the world will be when he returns. We don't know what the condition in our lives will be when he returns. We don't know if we'll be alive when he returns or if we'll be long been asleep when he returns. But what we have to do, like the farmer in James' example, is not to neglect to plant the spiritual seeds that we are told we have to plant. And not to say, well, I don't know when he's coming, so maybe it's going to be, uh, maybe I've got some time. All right? this, is, this is a great folly of the lost person to say, I've got more time. Right? And we don't need to mimic that uh, as redeemed people to say, well, I've got more time. Right? We, we need to live our lives as if he's coming this very moment, this very second. But we should still have long patience for it. Because we, uh, we know that, that life will bear precious fruit for God with patient waiting. And, and God uh, loves one who patiently waits. So how do we, how do we both uh, eagerly await and patiently await? <laughs> What's that? It's hard. Yeah, it's tough, right? Uh, but we, we, uh, we have to um, understand then what, what we're waiting for. We, we, we uh, eagerly await his return because we want to go home to him, don't we? Yes. But we also can understand as saved people uh, that, that there are people out there that are still lost. And that every, every day that he waits, someone's, someone's out there that could be redeemed. Someone that could come to the altar that day. And probably some of us here today that, that have not been saved for very long, you'd be very grateful that he waited for you, right? So we can still, we can still eagerly await him, knowing that, that we wait for him to come and we eagerly await his coming, but we understand that it is mercy and grace, and that's what he's talking about when he says, God is, is uh, we know that the Lord is pitiful and of tender mercy. That's what that, where that comes from, that, that we have to wait a little longer that's in Brother R.B.'s song that you sing there. Wait a little longer, please, Jesus. We also pray for him to wait longer, don't we? And that's because we, even though we eagerly await him, we, we also have to have compassion for those who are lost and, and be willing to wait still. Eagerly await and patiently wait. That's how you do it, both at the same time, is to understand that, that although we eagerly await him, it's hard not to, right? Eagerly, eagerly await him. It's a little harder to patiently wait. But we, we have to be in that, 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 uh, that place of love, that place of charity, or the selfless love, where even though what we want uh, has to be delayed, it's for, for, for the sake of others, for the sake of other souls. We need to, we need to, we need to pray also wait. So that's what he's talking about in verse 7 there, to be patient. So uh, like that, like that farmer. And it will bear precious fruit for God if we patiently wait. Because while we're waiting, or while he's waiting, and we're waiting on him, and we don't know the day, we can be out there in the field ministering to people, trying to make that time that we're waiting on him worth something. Make it bear precious fruit, James says. It will bear precious fruit. Like the farmer who plants the seeds, 
And he, he has faith, not when the rain will come, but that it will come. Right. Not what the conditions will be, but that the conditions will be good enough that there will come fruit up. And it's precious fruit out of that, out of that what he has planted. And uh, so James says, be patient then. In chapter 8, he says, prepare your heart for his coming. Establish your hearts. Because he is coming. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And every day delay, that's a soul saved, possibly. And if that soul, if that soul is you, don't wait any longer, because we're not guaranteed Amen. there's going to be another day. Right. There is no promise of tomorrow, and, and your life is not your own. It's your a price is paid. And if you're saved, then your life is not your own. If you're lost, <laughs> then a price has been paid. You just need to take hold. It's been paid for. You just need to go take it. I don't know if you've seen at these stores where you can pay for something and they just put it on a shelf and you just go in the store and grab it. I don't even know how that works. They don't know who you are or anything, but sometimes they have an app, I guess. But, like, it's paid. You just have to go pick it up. And, and that's, that's a great thing, I think. It's already been paid. You didn't have to pay for it. It's already been paid for you. So if you, if you do not understand that, understand it now that, that your life... Uh, is is not your own. So don't don't think that you have any control over it. Don't think that you have any control over uh, what's going to happen tomorrow or anything like that. What we can say, though, I have control over what I'm going to do today. I have control on the acts that I'm going to do, the, the works that I'm going to do, and the things I'm going to say. That will affect the spiritual... Uh, makeup of my, my, my life, my spiritual life. That I can affect. And that's what I will be judged by. You know, God's not going to judge you from circumstances that happen to you. He's going to judge you on how you respond to them spiritually. So that's what I can control. And the other things I can't. So that's where I need to go to God first. For the circumstances and things that I can't control, I need to go those to God. And for things that, I, that are my responsibility, that are lack of faith, or things that where I fail and, and sin... I also can go to God. How great is that? I can also go to him for things that are my responsibility and say, I need forgiveness. I need to be strengthened in faith. And I need God you to help me to, to uh, avoid this in the future. And he will answer it. So at that, that is why we, he's telling us then, grudge not one against another. And he says, brethren. So he's talking about people in the church here too. Brethren, grudge not one against another, lest you be condemned. So it will be, it'll be counted at the judgment throne, that will be counted at the judgment throne, because he says the judge standeth before the door, meaning not far away. How far away is this door from me? It's not far. How, how far was, if you were sprinting from this door trying to grab me, how, how long would it take you, like two seconds? Depends on if you're a big guy like me, maybe five seconds. But it does not, does not take long to get to you from a door. The judge is at the door. It's not the guy is at the door. He's the judge. And the judge will bring judgment. So he's at the door, and that's the judgment throne. So the throne is close by, and the one who can judge is at the door. So that's, that's both an admonition. Don't judge, because you'll be judged, but also a comfort. You don't have to judge. The judge is right there. Right. So whatever happens that you think, oh, that, that guy needs to get it. Well, he's going to get exactly what he's going, he needs to get. It will be a perfect justice. And it may be that he's forgiven. And I hope that's the case. Because that's what I got. That's right. And I want everybody to have that. Amen. So that's what he means by the judge is at the door. He's going to judge it, not me. So uh, the last uh, two verses there, he says, Take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. So the, we, we have read all through the Old Testament how the prophets have suffered. And John the Baptist even has suffered. He suffered greatly for what he said and died for it. And he says, because, behold, we count them happy which endure. So do we count the prophets that suffered so much happy for what they endured? We do now, don't they? Don't we? Because they, they ran the race to the end. And they've been rewarded. And uh, we know then that... that um, they are happy because they endured. And we have heard of the patience of Job. And we know of that story. That story is, is, to, is a reminder to us that if you run that race to the end and stay faithful, 
God will raise you up in the end. And that, that story of Job, it's a real story, but it's also a representation. It's a metaphor for, for our lives. We will have hardship through our lives. We have hardship all the way to the grave. And even, even death is, a, is something that's going to be hard on everybody. And, but, but we know that if we run to the end and we endure to the end, the same way Job did through his life, even to death, God will raise you up to a greater place than where you started. When you were born, you are born into a sinful body. When you're born to the Spirit and resurrected unto Christ, you'll be greater than you were when you were born to the body. You'll be raised up greater the way Job was at the end of his, of his uh, life, at his trial there. So that's what a reminder is. The prophets who suffered greatly, they've all been raised up to God. They've all endured hardship, probably greater hardship than any of us has, I would say. And they've all been raised up. You can be raised up the same way, just trusting God the way that they did. And, and you'll be raised up the same way they did, the same way they are right now. Let's pray and we'll, we'll end there. Lord God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the lessons that we can learn from it. We ask you, Father, just to be with us through the rest of the service. Let us uh, exalt you in prayer and, and worship as you so richly deserve. And we ask, Father, give a blessing to everyone who was here with us today. Those who couldn't be with us, Father, we ask just encouragement, strength, or healing, whatever's needed to, to bring them back to us so they can, they can worship you and, and fellowship with us, Father. And uh, we ask that you'll just be with us through the rest of the service. Let's lift our, our song leaders and our pastor and let us all just uh, learn what we would have us know so that we could take that as uh, out with us into the world and be our spiritual sword to battle the devil. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.